Just a quick reminder before we get into the lesson to download the hands-on lab exercises that accompany this complete CCNA course. I'll include the link in the description. Also remember to subscribe and hit the notifications bell so you don't miss any of the lessons in the course. Okay, let's get into it. In this lecture, you'll learn about the basics of dynamic routing protocols and how they compare to using static routes. When a routing protocol is used, routers will automatically advertise their best paths to known networks to each other. Routers will then use this information to determine their own best path to those known destinations. And if the state of the network changes, like if a link goes up or down, or if a new network is added to the topology, then the routers will automatically update each other with that information. Routers can use that information to automatically calculate a new best path and update their routing table in accordance with those network changes. So let's look at an example here. I've got three routers, R1, R2, and R3. To the right of R1, I've got the 10.0.1 24 and the 10.0.2 24 networks. R2 and R3 are not directly connected to those networks, so they're going to need a way to find out about them. I could either use my traditional static routing, which would require me as an administrator to configure static routes everywhere, or we can have them learn it automatically through the use of dynamic routing protocols. So what we'll do is we'll configure a routing protocol on both R1, R2, and R3, and they will then share information about their networks with each other. So we do that, we do the configuration, and R1 and R2 form a peering relationship with each other, and R2 and R3 also form an adjacency. R1 will then advertise its routes to R2. So it tells R2, hey, you can get to these networks via me, 10.0.1.0/24 and 10.0.2.0/24. That information will come in on the fast ethernet 0/0 interface on R2 and it will see that it came from R1 on the IP address of 10.0.0.1 slash 24 and it will then use that information to update its routing table so the routing table will now show that it's directly connected to the 10.0.0.0 slash 24 network that's on fast ethernet 0 slash 0 it's also directly connected to 10.1.0.0 slash 24 on fast ethernet 1 slash 0 and the two routes that it learned about from r1 10.0.1.0 and 10.0.2.0 slash 24 both have the next hop of 10.0.0.1 which is on r1 and the reachable out interface fast ethernet 0 slash 0. R2 also has a relationship with R3 so it will advertise information there as well. So R2 will tell R3 you can get to these networks via me 10.0.0.0, 10.0.1.0, and 10.0.2.0, all with a slash 24 mask. So R2 doesn't just advertise the routes it's directly connected to, it advertises the routes that it learned from R1 as well. Again, R3 can now update its routing table. It's got routes to 10.1.1.0 and 10.1.0.0 slash 24, which are connected on fast ethernet 0 slash 0 and 1 slash 0. And the routes that it learned about are 10.0.0.0, 10.0.1.0 and 10.0.2.0 slash 24. They're all reachable out its interface fast ethernet 1 slash 0. And the next hop address is R2 at 10.1.0.2. So again, just like with our static routes, R3 does not 
not see R1 as being the next hop because it's not directly connected to it. The next hop is always going to be reachable on a directly connected interface. That's R2 in this example. So that was how our routes got propagated from right to left, from R1 to R2 and then on, on to R3. Obviously, the same thing is going to also happen in the opposite direction, where R3 is going to advertise its routes to R2, which will then advertise them onto R1. So with this set up, all of the routes everywhere will be advertised everywhere, and the routers will update their routing tables with that information. Just like we could with static routes, we can use summary routes with our dynamic routing protocols as well. So the same example, but here R2 is going to learn about the 10.0.1 and the 10.0.2.0 slash 24 networks. Rather than advertising the 2 slash 24s to R3, we can have this configured so it will send a summary route to R3. So rather than the two individual slash 24s, it advertises 10.0.0.0 slash 16. Reasons we would do this. Summary routes lead to less memory usage in routers as their routing tables contain less routes. Obviously in our small example there it wouldn't make much difference, but this can make a big difference in really large networks. They also lead to less CPU usage as changes in the network only affect other routers in the same area. To explain this, I'll go back a slide. Let's say that the 10.0.1.1 link on R1 goes down. Well, when that happens, R2 will be notified that the link has gone down. And maybe there's an alternate path. Maybe up on the top, we've got R4, which has also got a route to get to 10.0.1.0 network. So when a link goes down, routers that have a route to it will reconverge. This means that they will recalculate their routing table, will try to find an alternate path. That takes up CPU cycles on the router. So R2 does have a route to 10.0.1.0 slash 24, so it's going to have to do that. R3, on the other hand, just has a route to 10.0.0.0 slash 16. It doesn't have that individual route to the 10.0.1 network, so its routing table doesn't actually change. Because it doesn't change, it doesn't need to recalculate anything. So because we were using summarization, R3 is going to be using less memory, it's got less routes, and also because we've compartmentalized our network, any outages or any changes are only going to affect that part of the network. They're not going to be propagated everywhere, which is going to take less CPU cycles on our other routers, not in that part of the network. Okay, so let's compare our dynamic routing protocols with static routes. It should be pretty obvious that dynamic routing protocols are more scalable than administrator-defined static routes. Using only static routes everywhere is really only feasible in very small environments. Reasons for this, with our dynamic routing protocols, the routers automatically advertise available subnets to each other without the administrator having to manually enter every route on every router. With static routing, the administrator does have to enter manually routes everywhere, which obviously is going to be very tedious and time consuming. Also, with our dynamic routing protocols, if a subnet is added or removed, the routers will automatically discover that and update their routing tables. Static route doesn't do that because it's all configured manually. And if the best path to a subnet goes down, dynamic routing protocol routers will automatically discover that and will calculate a new best path if one is available. With static routes, everything is manually configured by the administrator. It's a lot of admin work and it doesn't really recover very well from any failures. That's going to require additional manual admin work again. So you're probably thinking that in real world environments, we're going to use a dynamic routing protocol. And yes, for sure, in all but the smallest or test environments, we're always going to use a dynamic routing protocol. But that doesn't mean that we don't use static routes. It is pretty common that you'll use a combination of both a dynamic routing protocol and you'll also have some static routes there as well. 
In that case, the bulk of the information is going to be carried with your dynamic routing protocol. You're only going to use static routing for special use cases. For example, if you want to configure a backup route or for a static route to the internet. Now, that default static route to the internet, you're only going to need to do that on the router that is actually connected to the service provider. And all of the other routers inside that, what you can do is on the edge router, you can propagate that default static route into the routing protocol, and then you can have the routing protocol carry it through the rest of your network. So you're not gonna to need to configure a default static route on all of your routers, just the one that is on the edge. Okay, that's everything I needed to tell you in this first introductory lecture. Let's have a look at that information in the lab. We'll do that in the next lecture. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to get the complete course ad-free, Right now, then you can enroll in my CCNA Gold Bootcamp by clicking the link above my head or in the description. It also includes full study notes, quizzes, and 150 pages of additional troubleshooting labs you can't find anywhere else.